The lawyers and judges use the words, which some may find offensive. Thank you. Good morning. Please be seated. Um, just one or two housekeeping matters. Uh, Judge Sack was a member of this panel but recused himself. We're uh, joined uh, by Judge Laval. After we hear argument in the first case, we will adjourn for 10 minutes so that Judge Sack can join us for the balance of the calendar. Um, the second matter is I left it to the parties to divide up uh, the time allocated, and I assume they've done that. So um, let me call uh, Fox versus FCC, and we also have, I see on the calendar, CBS and NBC as interveners arguing. Um, uh, so will Fox take the podium? Good morning, Honor. Carter Phillips representing Fox Television. I will also be the only counsel arguing uh, on our side in this case. In 2002, uh, the renowned actress and singer Cher uh, responded to her critics uh, in a television show by saying, fuck them. And in 2003, uh, Nicole Ritchie, who is a, an actress, commented on her own television show, which, involved, which is entitled The Simple Life, by saying that it was hardly all that simple because does anybody know how hard it is to get, how fucking hard it is to get cow shit out of a Prada purse. And, did uh, Fox plan those, no. those uh, statements? No, there's no dispute that Fox did not plan them. The only assessment by the FCC is that Fox was arguably negligent and failing adequately to uh, respond to the possibility that, our, that those statements might be offered. But Would it have made a difference if Fox knew in advance? Will you concede that? Well, it would have, it would have satisfied the intent standard that we believe is appropriate uh, under the statute, but it still, from our perspective, it, wouldn't, it still wouldn't make this conduct indecent. And both of those um, uh, award shows were on the air before the Golden Globes order. Is yes, that both correct? of them predated the Golden Globes order. So as of that point in time, you know, we have 30 years of unbroken precedent where the Commission recognizes, obviously, that the use of these expletives is offensive to some, but has never declared that the use of these expletives is a basis for any kind of a sanction. I mean, we start... Let me just say a few words. First, let me ask you all to recognize that the acoustics in this room are terrible. So okay. please uh, uh, speak good and loud. Uh, uh, emphatically uh, and clearly. Uh, I, I just, I don't see why, I don't understand why Fox's uh, knowledge or lack of knowledge really has anything to do with the question whether, uh, whether what comes out on the air is, is, is indecent or profane. Oh, I agree uh, it may have a lot to do with whether a penalty should be imposed, which was not imposed in this case, but uh, uh, you would agree, I take it, that that planned or unplanned has nothing to do with whether the content is indecent. Right. I think if, if it's scripted and intended to be put forward on the air, there's still the fundamental question as to whether or not the particular words can be, can be declared to be indecent. And then after that, obviously, you go into the question of intent. Or if they're integral to the work, then they may, may be found not indecent, like saving Private Ryan. Right. There's no question that the Commission has a, a basic approach that says that we will presume that the use of, of these particular expletives, fuck and shit, are specific words, is, is presumptively indecent, and then you have the opportunity to come in and, and try to rebut that presumption by saying that there is some contextual basis for supporting it. But, you know, obviously the creation of the presumption in the first instance is a complete departure from any notion of context, because it's saying 
These are words that are categorically barred, which is something the Commission has never said in 30 years of, of enforcement of indecency. Well, the words are the same. The regulation is the same that's been in effect, hasn't it? It's just it's a different level of enforcement. It's a, it's a demonstrably different level. And it's not new words. They always, and these are the words that have been used in other contexts as well. It's the barring of the reference to sexual and excretory activities and organs. Well, the generic policy has been essentially unchanged since 19, from, since Pacifica was decided in 1978. But yes, you're right, Your Honor. What has changed dramatically is the Commission's decision that any use of these particular words becomes essentially a per se violation, regardless of the context, which, as I say, a dramatic departure from anything that existed so this prior to is this. Um, an agency that changed how they view uh, words that pre existed. Um, and they started by 2001 giving industry guidance, which didn't change. Didn't change the a thing on the score, no, Your Honor. And then in 2004, issued the Golden Globes order. Um, do you argue before us that they didn't? give reasoned analysis for the yes, change? Yes, that is precisely what we're arguing, Your Honor. That if you look at the justification for the change, all that's put on, in place is, a, is this first bite principle. That's essentially their argument, which is that you have to stop any kind of, of uh, exposure to these words for, the, for children. And what would the, they have had to do to convince you that it was a reasoned analysis? Well, what, what, could they tell you that children were harmed if such studies exist? That, that would certainly, you know, to the, I mean, I think it would be very difficult to demonstrate that exposure to a single word could remotely injure children. But well, for children who live in bubbles, it would be fine. But if they live in the world, your argument might be more persuasive. But if you can keep the child away from every form of communication, then that's fine. And, and if the Commission can identify any child in that category who is nevertheless watching broadcast television, that would be quite an extraordinary achievement. But it's a burden that seems to me that there wasn't sorry, reasoned analysis or that there wasn't sufficient, sufficient proof and evidence to support the reasoned analysis? It, it's both, actually. I don't think there is a reasoned analysis well, embedded in here. Is that something that, um, in your view, could simply be plugged up? Uh, by, uh, by setting forth some, some more extensive analysis? Or is it your position that the, that, the, that the position taken by the Commission is simply unjustifiable so that, um, so that there can't be any reasoned analysis of something that's unjustifiable? I mean, our, our alternative argument, obviously, is that this is First Amendment protected activity and that you need to have a compelling state interest that is, and narrow tailoring, and you're not I mean, going to get puzzled, that in this I've been puzzled by your argument about lack of reasoned analysis. It, it seems to me that, that, uh, that they explain why they take the position that they take. Um, they do, but I don't think it's reasoned, Judge LaBelle. I think the problem with that is their argument is that you have to prevent children from any exposure to these particular words, and then they proceed in the same breath to recognize that exposure to these particular words is routinely permitted at these, at these particular times if it can be justified on, on alternative grounds. E either there is a, a huge compelling so the overriding interest in Now is, is more along the lines of that there can be no reasoned analysis of something that's inherently unreasonable. I think that, yeah, at the end of the day that is our argument. But you don't have to get to that point, I don't think, if you, if you want to simply say, the Commission hasn't come up with an adequate justification for a 180-degree reversal of its precedent. If it wants to go back and try again, I suppose that's fine. So if, what would be an adequate justification to get back to what I think was Judge LaValle's original question? Well, in the context of a, of a single use of an expletive, I don't know that there's ever going to be anything that satisfies that. So I, the bottom line of your argument here, then, Mr. Phillips, is that the FCC can, cannot regulate the fleeting expletive, if you will. I, I think that's right, although I, I, you know, I, I, I don't have to sustain that argument. All I have to demonstrate is they haven't done it to date. If they want to go back and try to do it, that's fine. But it does seem to me that... But you know, counsel, that um, courts like ours have a natural conservatism about reaching issues that we don't have to reach. It, um, we always will decide less rather than more. And if we can avoid constitutional questions, it's part of our uh, prudential um, uh, uh, the way we operate. Why would we reach out 
if, um, if we agreed that it wasn't a reasoned analysis. If you agree that the agency could give a reasoned analysis that would satisfy the requirements, and then why wouldn't we give them an opportunity to do so? Well, that's exactly why we make the first argument that, that uh, this fails under the APA, because we recognize that there's a constitutional avoidance doctrine, and the court shouldn't jump to the First Amendment if it's convinced that there's a narrower basis on which to decide the issue. At, at the end of the day, though, in, in response to Judge Laval's question, which is, do I think personally that you can, that you can regulate this kind of speech Ever. consistent with the First Amendment? position is no, I don't believe so, but if the court wishes to give the commission an opportunity to try to undertake to make that kind of a showing, if there's a bubble child out there and that child will be hugely disturbed by exposure to a single word, I mean, to me that is utterly implausible, but I suppose if the commission wanted to make some effort along those lines, And that's then what you'd be looking for, their, their argument that they really are preventing harm to an identifiable population. That would have to be what they, the, the, under Turner, they have to sustain that. They cannot simply posit the existence of a harm and assume that whatever they're doing is, is responsive to it. They have to make a showing. The impact of this sort of an order has uh, changed so dramatically. The potential impact has changed with the, with the technology and the, and, the, and the different means of communication. There was a time when, uh, when radio and television uh, uh, that, that when regulated radio and television uh, consumed a gigantic, almost the entirety of, of, of this kind of, of provision of entertainment or, 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 or communication. Now, uh, I don't know what percentage it is or how one would measure that, but with the, with the cable channels that are un, unregulated and the, and the internet communication, um, it's more like um, the FCC uh, by its regulation is simply establishing a zone in which um, in which relative or a certain degree of freedom from what they identify as indecency or profanity exists but there are all these other other zones which are completely unregulated right and not only unregulated but frankly indistinguishable from the viewers perspective I, I would submit I just last night as I was sitting in my that hotel room. Does favor? That, fa this? that favors us, it seems to me, because... Why doesn't it favor regulating cable? Because cable, well, I mean, it, it may favor regulating cable, but I think it's going to be difficult to okay, overcome the no First Amendment hurdle. statutory authority or constitutional authority? Well, I don't think there's, uh, it's going to, there's a serious First Amendment problem in trying to regulate cable, and, and I don't know that the Commission is going to be prepared to And then, to of course, there would have to that. be movie regulation. Too, I guess. Right. You're going to have to go across the board. You're not going to be able to parse out a specific area of the media. But the, the point I was going to make is that from the viewer's perspective, there is no distinction between a cable TV channel and a, and a well, there's network the distinction channel. That there's the distinction that somebody who, uh, somebody who wants uh, to have their children to, to better protect against their children uh, hearing this stuff uh, can simply not have cable can have only regulated television in their house or can somehow uh, uh, make rules in their house that their children don't watch cable and don't watch internet stuff but only watch so it 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 provides a vehicle with with less constitutional impact i mean there's less suppression of speech if the only suppression is within this range of of regulated uh, regulated network programming. Yeah, the two, there are two answers to that, Judge LaBelle. First of all, of course, the, those same parents obviously have access to the V-chip as a technology to help regulate what the their children can get to. The V-chip doesn't protect against an unexpected uh, uh, fleeting expletive. Well, it can, depending on the, on how the, on the particular show is rated. But it's, then we it, would get back to Fox knowing in advance that uh, Cher would be so effusive in thanking her supporters. Well, the alternative would be obviously that you might you might impose a, a somewhat higher rank rating in order to anticipate the possibility, even if you didn't on actually that's believe. Live? I'm sorry. On anything that's live. I, I suppose you could go that far, although I think that would be way overkill, given that uh, an awful lot of live televi television doesn't, I think, s raise a serious risk of doing it. But at the end of the day, the most obviously more a appropriate response to all this is to recognize that we're talking about First Amendment values here and the question is not is there some mechanism by which we ought to be looking for a way to regulate what we're talking about as First Amendment values but rather to place the burden on the Commission to demonstrate that there is a compelling need and that their approach 
is narrowly tailored to achieve that compelling need. And I submit to you, they, one, haven't sustained, they, they haven't undertaken to sustain that burden. Candidly, I don't believe that they could ever actually accomplish that uh, uh, under any circumstances so, so in any of So you believe, event. even though the words were part of um, the FCC's uh, decency regime for 30 years, um, that now when they go to enforce it, there really can't, cannot be um, indecency regulation. It's important to be very clear about what their regime was for 30 years. Speech that is indecent must involve more than the isolated use of an offensive word. That's the policy that's been out there. And now they have admitted that it's a changed policy. For a while they said it was always somehow lurking there. Well, they say that it's always been lurking there, but I can assure you from the, from the network's perspective, it has never been assumed that there was any potential risk. And indeed, if you look at the 1987 Pacifica order, which specifically approves, you know, a, a, against an indecency charge, the uses of the phrases motherfucker, eat shit, and fuck the USA, right. and walks away from them and says those aren't indecent. Two, two observations. Uh, uh, I don't think the FCC ever took the position, as you just described it, that in order to be indecent it must involve more than a fleeting expletive there was a likelihood that, that, uh, that there would be no finding of indecency uh, without repetition or something more than a fleeting expedite. But it, I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that the FCC took the position as categorically as you said it. But secondly, why does that matter? Uh, if they've changed their position and if they have given a reasoned explanation of the change of their position, I know you argue they have not, but if they have explained it in a manner that satisfies the legal requirement, why do we care if they've uh, changed their position? Well, I take issue with the premise, because I do think that they have consistently taken the position that if all we're talking about is an isolated expletive, that that by itself does not rise to the level of indecency. Well, they, they said, said that, that on a factor, number of occasions. A factor in finding, uh, in finding uh, a patent offensiveness would be repetition, but that's clearly correct. If there's more and more and more of it, that's more and more likely to be a, offensive. But um, the, 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 can you point to me a, a place in writing in which the FCC said, um, if it's only a fleeting, a single use of an expletive, it will not be found to be it, it, I mean, I, I don't know how to read it any closer than the Pacifica case, and I'll read the language to you. If a complaint focuses solely on the use of expletives, we believe that under the legal standards set forth in Pacifica, deliberate and repetitive use in a patently offensive manner is a requisite to a finding of indecency. And have they ever tried the to find liability for a fleeting expletive before uh, Golden Globes? No, no. So, so it's not that they didn't. They may. They've written it. You say, but and they never tried to enforce it. No, what they what and they reckon. Were fleeting expletives, by the way? Were there fleeting expletives? On, uh, on broadcast radio or television um, in the years between Pacifica and Golden Globe. Oh, absolutely. Numerous times. As I said, I, don't, I won't repeat the words, but the, Thanks. But the, the, <laughs> but the, you know, the three words were in the Pacifica order that it gave rise to the language that I just quoted to Judge Lavelle. They, I mean, so there's no question that so the, the commission has dealt with So the FCC didn't believe issues. that their, uh, the, the need to regulate was triggered by a fleeting expletive until uh, the Golden Globes order. Right, and and what it seems to me the commission's what burden. Happened? What happened in those years? Well, that's the that's the. I was just going to say that that's the commission's burden. Why is it that the first bite becomes overwhelming in 2004 when it was not a source of any concern to the commission from 1978 until 2004? And that's to me the core APA problem. As I say, I think at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to sustain this under the First Amendment. Counsel, you, your red light has, has gone up, but I'm watching the time. I will give the FCC an equal amount of time. I have two questions. Thank you. Um, you rely heavily on uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Reno uh, versus um, ACLU, um, uh, which uh, found which uh, found that the same language that we're talking about here when it related to the Communications Decency Act was unconstitutional. But didn't Reno distinguish Pacifica, and it doesn't Pacifica, isn't it still alive after Reno? Well, Reno clearly distinguished Pacifica, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting the court reversed Pacifica. We all agree that Pacifica still is 
the law. But Pacifica didn't address the specific question here of the vagueness. I mean, that was not the issue in Pacifica. It was simply whether the Commission has any authority consistent with the First Amendment to regulate indecency that doesn't specifically relate to sexual conduct. That was the precise issue that was posed in Pacifica, and that's the only issue, frankly, the Court decided. It's a, it is a, an excruciatingly narrow holding. So it didn't really decide the, and and the we know vagueness it wasn't issue. Fleeting expletives in I'm Pacifica. Sorry, it was clearly not fleeting um, expletives. <laughs> the next question, if you know, um, do you know how the networks decided what to broadcast in those golden years between Pacifica and Golden Globes, and if they do something different now? No, they, they are basic standards that all of the networks have, and they're actually embodied Has in the record. Has anything changed? I mean, that, that's the harm that you claim. Are, are, are they doing? self-censorship? Is there evidence that they've, that they have a different regime in deciding what they put on the air? Well, I mean, the, the clearest evidence of that is the 911 program, where that's a program, it's a Peabody award-winning program that CBS aired twice, and then when they were going to air it on the fifth anniversary of 9-11, 10% of the United States audience was, was precluded from seeing that show because the affiliates panicked because of the use of expletives and in that particular program. And the difference was pre and post Golden Globes. And pre and post Golden Globes. And that's, that's what, you know, there is an entire interorum regime that the Commission has now created as a consequence of Golden Globes, left in place for 32 months and a day without coming out with a response to the petitions for reconsideration. And they leave it out there for the networks to well, respond what is to. What's the status? Well, it, well, uh, it's uh, Golden Globes. I think NBC is the would be is the company against. Two. Well, all, yeah, the, the, but all of the networks, and indeed the entire. I have participated. Are, everybody's you filed participating comments? and asking for the commission to come out with a decision in that. Um, either of you have questions? If yes, I, I would uh, like to hear you uh, direct your arguments to the uh, issue of the distinction in Saving Private Ryan and that whole area of, um, of um, finding one use of expletives to be passable while another is not. Well, I think the, the fundamental problem that comes out of the pri Saving Private Ryan for the Commission is that the only rationale they've offered for how that, why they've changed their entire regime is the notion that any exposure by any child to an expletive uh, creates a nuisance. And the problem with that argument is that, it, it, and how do you justify ever allowing any expletives to be aired under any circumstances? It seems to me that, that the Commission really has two choices in front of it. It can either ban all ex or attempt to ban all expletives, which it, it seems clearly not willing to do, and I assume doesn't believe it can, consistent with the First Amendment, or it can go back to the regime that it, that it in fact put in place and that was approved in Pacifica, which talks about the kind of shock treatment that Justice Powell identified, and say, you know, when you have that, then we're going we're to enforce our indecency regime. Anything in between them, it seems to me, it creates nothing but a censorial board with the commission picking and choosing what it likes and what it doesn't like in a way that is inherently arbitrary, both as a matter of APA review well, and as a matter of Do you think it's arbitrary and unjustifiable to distinguish between Nicole Ritchie and save, Saving Private Ryan? No, I, I mean, I don't think you can do that. And I think that's precisely what I was going to quote Justice Powell on that, because I, I thought he said the point quite well. I do not subscribe to the theory. And remember, he's the, he's the deciding vote in, in Pacifica. The justices of this court, and I would take that to extend to the commission as well, are generally free to decide on the basis of its content which speech protected by the First Amendment is most valuable and hence deserving of the most protection and which is less valuable and hence As I understand of less the, the distinction that was made in favor of saving Private Ryan was not based on on value, but based on on um, on on the question of patent defensiveness to the community. Is that am I not correct? In well, I mean, you, you can ask the commission if that's if that's the distinction they think exists. But I, I would read their distinction to have said that there is a a, a broader value. Wasn't the explanation in that in a that in the context in which it was presented in, in Saving context. Private Ryan, yes. uh, viewers did not find it offensive in the same way that they would when somebody simply stands up at an awards ceremony and says, fuck them, or 
whatever. Right. Well, as I understand it, what they what they really say is that that if you take out that particular language, you distort the the message that's that's being it delivered in private Ryan, and right, it had artistic integral. merit. Right. That's their argument. So someone is deciding that we can't um, give those two uh, words to the Nicole Richie performance. Someone decided that. That right. it was an integral to her um, giving an award, and it had no artistic merit. Right, but of course that's that's not the fundamental issue. That's only if you get to the point where you conclude in the first instance that an isolated expletive is itself per se indecent. Then you get to the issue of whether or not there's some particular reason to speak that way. But it does seem to me that at the end of the day, all you're really doing is is creating a regime that allows you to say this is better speech than this is. And while I can't imagine a regime that is more antithetical to the First Amendment values. If there are no other questions, I've added to 10 minutes to your time, and I'll give the. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and you've reserved five minutes. I have reserved I, five I, minutes. I won't go into that, so I will give up to 29 minutes to the FCC. Thank you. May it please the Court, Eric Miller for the Federal Communications Commission. All that is before the Court here is two adjudications. In both of these cases, the Fox Television Network broadcast the F word on primetime television. In neither case did the, does Fox make any effort to defend or to justify the use of that language. Uh, so the only issue here is that raised by the conceitedly gratuitous use of the F word on an entertainment awards show when children are in the audience. Uh, the Federal Communications Why isn't this just a sort of I mean, Taking your, your point of view, which I'm not necessarily sure I agree with, why isn't this this just the sort of Damocles hanging over the head of every uh, broadcast station around. I mean, the, because the only thing that the commission has decided in this case uh, is that the in those circumstances, the use of those words, which Mr. Miller has recited for us several times, uh, is inappropriate and is subject to fine. Right. Maybe. That's where you want to leave it. Well, let me give you a hypothetical, Mr. Miller. This. Uh, is being fed out by cable here, and presumably the broadcast media can pick it up. And let's say they uh, pick up the portion of Mr. Miller's argument, or excuse me, Mr. Phillips' argument. I'm sorry, thank you. Um, and I won't repeat your brief since we have the words in the record here. But the use of the wor the words "fuck" and "shit" are actually broadcast over six o'clock news tonight. I, I, is that going to be subject to FCC? Um, Hand slapping? I, I think plainly not, uh, for the uh, reasons because? for the reasons stated uh, in in this very order, uh, with respect to the early showcase, uh, the commission has emphasized that it will exercise great restraint uh, when it comes to news programs. All right. Well, let me. There's no news exception. You, you say there's no news. Th there exception. There isn't a, a news exception in the sense that you can't simply slap the label news on any broadcast well, and let immunize let me give it. Give you the hypothetical. Expand the hypothetical where Fox wanting to air so its viewers are reminded of exactly what's at issue here, pulls up the clips from the uh, Billboard Music Awards and shows those two instances of Cher and Nicole Richie as background or in conjunction with reporting on what's happening in this courtroom here today. I mean, to, to, to be indecent, the, the use of the language has to be patently offensive, which under the Commission's analysis requires that it be so presented. So how is a rebroadcast of the clip in the context of news any less offensive than it is in the Billboard Awards? Because it, in that context, uh, as the Commission explained in, in the early show order, it's not being presented to, to pander or to titillate or for shock value. It's being presented uh, to inform viewers of what the case Can is I about. Can talk about the early show for a second? Because you just said that you can't slap the word news on anything. Okay, so this is what you found uh, merited a news exception. It was a discussion of a reality show, correct? Yeah, no, that's now, right. now that's not real in the sense of being real. It's an entertainment show, correct? That's right. And the exception that the FCC found for news was someone who had, as I understand it, been um, uh, made to exit from that show, talking about people who were still left on that show, and you called that news? The, the Just asking. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the Commission is not... What in, wouldn't be news under that standard? Well, I, I mean, the, the, the Commission is not in the business of second-guessing uh, the journalistic and editorial judgments uh, of broadcasters. Uh, the early show is... So why can't they call everything news? 
Uh, you just said you can't slap news on anything, I mean, and the, now the, you're saying you're not in the habit of second guessing. Which the, is it? The, the, the test that the commission articulated in the early show order is that we would that we said we would defer to CBS's plausible characterization of the program as a news show. Did you mean to suggest by the use of the word plausible that it was a stretch? Uh, not necessarily. I, I think I, that the, that word is just in there to emphasize that it is indeed a, a very broad exception. But questions of the breadth of the news exception are not implicated here, where there is conceitedly, uh, you know, no journalistic uh, theory uh, on which uh, well, Nicole Richie's language. Was the announcement of important music awards somehow journalism? Uh, one could perhaps argue that, but Fox has not made that argument. It didn't say that before the commission. Uh, it hasn't said that in this court. Uh, at every stage of this case, it has made no effort uh, to defend the language that was used by Ms. Ritchie uh, or by Cher uh, the, use the, the year before. But so, you're suggesting if they had, that might be plausible? I mean, it, it would depend on, on exactly uh, what they said. Uh, but that would be something that the commission would have to take seriously. I mean, it, it, it's significant, I think, that uh, the Commission has never um, found a broadcast to be indecent on the basis of an isolated expletive in the face of some claim uh, that the use of that language was necessary for, for any uh, journalistic or, or artistic uh, so purpose. So are you suggesting now that um, this could save the FCC um, indecency policy? Are you telling the network, so I think are all here today, to just make some kind of cockamamie pl claim and, and they'll survive? I mean, I, I, I'm not, I, it's not necessary for this court to decide exactly what uh, sort of justification would be necessary and how that factors in uh, to the analysis of whether the use of the language is uh, pandering or, or, or shocking or titillating. Yeah, so because in this Golden case. Why has Golden Globes been pending for two years? Why does this case come where you rely on the policy enunciated in Golden Globes and um, find liability, although no forfeiture? Why does this case come to a court before Golden Globes itself, which has been uh, moldering uh, before the Commission for more than two years? I mean, the, the omnibus order w was issued uh, initially this spring as part of an effort to give guidance uh, to broadcasters. Uh, Your Honor is correct, the Golden Globes petition has been pending uh, for a long time, uh, but that has not caused any hardship. Uh, to the networks because well, this case involves... Well, it's watch it because the very policy, it, it, it relates to the question I asked Mr. Phillips about our um, prudential rules. Um, if we cannot reach constitutional issues, uh, we certainly prefer not to, and, and that's, that's the way we operate, to decide the least amount. And in this case, it is not entirely clear that we must reach the constitutional issues, but I can't imagine how they would not be reached in Golden Globes, which enunciates the very policy that's, that we're talking about here. Well, this uh, re-articulates and, and, and restates and applies the Golden Globe policy. So it, we, we don't question that it, the, the Golden Globe policy and its validity is before uh, the court here, and it's appropriate for the court to consider uh, that policy in the context of its application uh, to these two cases. Uh, which involved so retreating from your jurisdictional argument that you made in your brief that we only have jurisdiction to look at the two cases in which you found liability. Can uh, we now? I, I think you just said that the Golden Go Globes policy is before us. Well, the, the Golden Globes policy was part of. I mean, by by Golden Globes policy, what I mean is uh, the idea that the Commission has articulated that. Uh, the fleeting nature of uh, a reference does not immunize it uh, from the possibility of indecency liability. That idea is part of the Commission's analysis in its adjudication of these cases. So in reviewing those adjudications, uh, the Court can look at the analysis uh, that the Commission used uh, to reach those conclusions. Uh, what we suggest is not before the Court uh, is issues like uh, artistic justification, um, the, the issues uh, raised in, in, in other cases that are still pending before the Commission. Uh, all that's before the Court is what the Commission has actually done in this order, not uh, what the networks uh, are worried that the Commission might do in some hypothetical future order. But isn't that always going to be the case? I mean, you, you're going to decide one case and say, well, that's, that's the only issue before you now, so you just have to look at how we've taken this policy, which you're saying we can't look at with either narrowly or broadly, and 
limiting you're seeking to limit us to just looking at how it's been applied to the uh, to the billboard issue here billboard awards well, we, I mean we, we, we acknowledge that you can uh, evaluate the, the Commission's reasoning in, in reaching the conclusion that it reached in, in this adjudication so it certainly uh, the, the is appropriate for the court to consider the question of um, you know, the, the validity of the, the agency's reasoning in, in concluding that there shouldn't be a, a per se categorical uh, exemption uh, for fleeting utterances. Um, and, and we would suggest that that uh, reasoning was valid because all, all that the APA requires is that the Commission uh, acknowledge that it has changed course, which it plainly did, and offer a justification uh, for the change. A reasoned analysis. Th that's right. And here the, the justification flows directly from Pacifica. Uh, Pacifica teaches that context is critical uh, in but an evaluation. But there were all those years between Pacifica and Golden Globes where the FCC didn't feel compelled to um, sanction fleeting expletives, which I have to believe existed and were broadcast. I mean, there's nothing in the record on, on the extent uh, to which they existed uh, during that time. Uh, but the, what the Commission emphasized in its order here is that uh, an evaluation of context uh, is critical. And so therefore, it's inappropriate to take what ought to be just one factor in, in the multi-factor contextual analysis, namely, was the statement repeated uh, or was it isolated, and to elevate that one factor uh, to determinative significance. Um, rather, it's appropriate to look at all of the factors together, just as the Commission does not have a rule that multiple expletives will necessarily make a broadcast indecent. Uh, an example of that is saving well, I'd like Ryan. to come back to the, uh, to the manner of distinguishing between circumstances where the use of expletives, whether fleeting or multiple, will result in liability and those in which they won't. And, and, and the, the, uh, uh, as part of that question, the issue of the context of news, the issue in the context of a, of a film like Saving Private Ryan. And I'm trying to understand what is the basis on which the um, FCC makes the distinction. Is it, is it a matter, uh, as under the um, uh, Miller versus California standard, of the FCC uh, making its own evaluation of artistic or social or scientific or uh, uh, some other kind of worth of the material? Or is it a matter of, of the FCC uh, making its attempt to assess community standards? W what is it that offends the community and what doesn't offend the community? In other words, is the, is the community offended by hearing uh, uh, these expletives in the context of a news a, a, a taking the hypothetical of supposing that that the um, that a news program reporting on this very argument this morning were to take the clip of share and show it as what gave rise to to this, uh, there was a suggestion that that might not be um, might not give rise to liability where the original did. So what is the route by which the FCC might arrive at those two conclusions? I think doctrinally it's part of the community standards analysis. There's so it's not, not the FCC's evaluation of worth. It's not as no. in Miller versus California, we think this has or doesn't have artistic value. That, that, it's that we think the community doesn't find it offensive in the same way when they're, when they're seeing it exhibited as what is legitimately a news broadcast what was the broadcast that gave rise to this big fuss? That, that, that's exactly right. And, and analytically, the, the way that the Commission deals with that uh, is that patent offensiveness under community standards is evaluated uh, with a three-part test. And one of the factors in that test is, was the material uh, pandering or titillating or presented for its shock value? And if it's part of a news broadcast or if it's uh, like the language in Saving Private Ryan, uh, it's not being presented to pander or titillate. And yet it's, being it's the same words spoken by the same person, and you can find that the context changes the shock value. That, that's right, and that's exactly what Pacifica says, that the indecency regulation is conducted under a nuisance rationale, uh, and in, under that rationale, context is all important. Well, it seems to me to be, to be quite reasonable uh, as a hypothesis. I mean, for example, if one says, uh, would you be shocked to hear that a judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals on the bench said, fuck. Well, it might make a big difference whether it was in the course of this argument or in the course of uh, a case that has nothing to do with the subject matter. In, in, indeed it would. Uh, and, and that's what uh, 
what this what the test recognizes. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the the additional justifications that the commission has provided for uh, for departing from a, a categorical rule uh, is that. As Pacifica says, uh, it's inappropriate to require children or, or the audience, and especially children, uh, to take the first blow. Uh, what the networks are really asking for so is... do you make them leave before the news comes on tonight? Uh, or do they not get a first blow? Does, the ch does a child who uh, ostensibly is, that you're trying to protect, does that child distinguish between um, hearing share, say, uh, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to repeat it. Or hearing uh, Judge Laval, or just seeing the clip. Does it make a difference to the child? Isn't every one of them a first blow? Well, I think context might well make a difference even there. But more fundamentally, uh, the government's interest is not unimportant uh, merely because the government is not committed to pursuing that interest in all contexts, regardless of the cost. Uh, we so recognize you see a limit, a limit to what you can do to protect children in our society uh, because uh, there are countervailing values. Uh, indeed there are, uh, and that's, that's part of the uh, genesis of the, the ex policy of restraint with respect to news uh, programming. You understand um, the petitioner and interveners and most of the um, amicus, the amici, have a hard time understanding those boundaries because they are not objective, they're subjective, they claim. So you just said that what Cher said on the billboard award show um, merited liability, but if it was played tonight on the news as informational, it wouldn't merit liability, and this seems to be a scheme that depends on what you think, instead of having, uh, I don't mean you personally, Mr. Miller, uh, instead of having objective criteria that the um, petitioners can use in formulating their broadcast day. I think there are several responses to that, Your Honor. First, just uh, as a preliminary point, uh, the Commission didn't find that Cher's broadcast merited liability. Uh, I mean, there, there was no fine imposed here. It was simply declared. Well, I, I don't mean liability in the sense of a forfeiture. You found that it violated the Golden Globes order. Did, did you not? I mean, it, it violated Section 1464 and the indecency uh, regulation. Uh, but uh, to, to return to your question, the, uh, whatever vagueness or vagueness argument there might be at, at the periphery of uh, the indecency standard, those questions are not presented in this case because all that is issue at issue here is the conceitedly gratuitous use uh, of the F word in an entertainment program. I thought you agreed early on in your time at the podium that the Golden Globes policy from which the liability in this case springs must be before us. Well, all that the policy says is that, I mean, the, the, the policy that the Commission applied here is that the fact that an utterance is isolated will not immunize it from indecency liability. Um, so that's the, the question of what uh, context might make uh, the use of this language uh, non-indecent is not implicated here because there's no argument on the part of petitioners uh, that there was anything about this context that would have justified uh, this language. I would also uh, <coughs> point out that the, uh, the standard uh, of indecency, which has to be applied by the FCC and which was applied in this case, is exactly the standard that was upheld in Pacifica. And as this court recognized in Dial Information Services, uh, Pacifica forecloses a vagueness challenge to that standard because... Uh, 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 tell me why you think that's, that's true. Because... I mean, that, was, it, was, it, was there a vagueness challenge in Pacifica? Th there was a vagueness challenge asserted. I, I, the court I, think, did not I, I think everyone agreed what was said in those 12 minutes, and I don't think that Pacifica ever argued um, that they thought that that 12-minute uh, broadcast wouldn't come under the standards as articulated. They, they had no reason to raise vagueness in that case. Uh, they, they, were, they were making a, a challenge to the Commission's definition of indecency, uh, and their, part of their challenge was that it was unconstitutional under the First Amendment insofar as the definition of indecency extended beyond obscenity. But, um, but that's not the same as a vagueness challenge. Well, they, I mean, they thought, I believe they thought that the 12-minute broadcast 
came within the definition. They didn't know if you had the right to impose that definition, but that's different than a vagueness challenge. Th th this court held in Dial Information Services uh, that Pacifica forecloses uh, a vagueness challenge to the very definition uh, of indecency uh, that, that is at issue here. Dial Information Services involved uh, the telephone uh, pornography uh, messages and the FCC used the same indecency definition there. It was challenged as unconstitutionally vague. And in Dial Information Services, the court said that Pacifica forecloses. And was that central to the holding? In, in Dial Information, yes, that, that is the holding of, um, of Dial Information Services. Um, uh, and it, it is also the holding, I would note, of uh, the en banc DC circuit uh, in the ACT litigation. Um, Council, the FCC views um, um, their role as only policing um, sexual and excretory activities and organs. Is that correct? That, that's the definition. Of um, and I'm asking you this just because there were no studies, um, as we've as we've said. You believe there are necessary studies of the harm that comes to children from hearing about sexual or excretory organs or activities. There were no studies attached. You think there are necessary? I'm just stating. A fact. That's right. There were no studies before the court in Pacifica. Right. So I ask you, though, that there are so many studies that are available, some of them, I'm sure, um, valid um, academic studies about the effect of violence on children. How come the FCC hasn't seen that when they're policing the airwaves and worrying about children? How come they have not paid any attention to that at all? I, I believe that there is a, a pending study uh, of the issue of violence. Uh, but you're right that so far there hasn't been any uh, rulemaking or, or adjudicative action uh, that I'm aware of. Unless uh, the violence was in the context of sexual or excretory organs or activities, but then it would get your interest. Well, I mean, what, what the definition of indecency that was before the court in Pacifica and that the, the court upheld uh, is one based on descriptions or depictions of, of sexual or excretory uh, organs or activities. Um, well, what's the consequence? Um, uh, how is this argument affected, if at all, by the by the change in the universe resulting from the growth of uh, of cable and internet communication? Does that favor one side or the other in this dispute, and how? I think it's not affected, and for two reasons. First, uh, even if one concluded that the rise of uh, cable and the internet and other media had in some way undermined the factual premises. Uh, that were the basis for the court's reasoning in Pacifica. Um, Pacifica remains good law, and until the Supreme Court decides that it's time to overrule Pacifica, uh, it's binding here. Uh, but, but beyond that, uh, the Commission actually made specific factual findings in this case that the premises of Pacifica, namely that broadcasting is uniquely pervasive and uniquely accessible to children, uh, remain true today. So for example, even though cable television is now um, very, very common, uh, there are still a large number of broadcast-only televisions. Uh, a substantial fraction of children who have televisions in their uh, bedrooms have broadcast-only TVs. And of course, parents who subscribe to cable uh, can exercise some choice in their selection of a package. Tell those parents to get the televisions out of the bedrooms. Uh, <laughs> well, the, I mean, the 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 pervasiveness of, of broadcast. I mean, it, it is something that the court recognized. Uh, in Pacifica and in Turner, the court recognized that broadcast television is a, a pervasive part of uh, and makes a unique contribution to our national discourse. But don't you think a parent who allows a child to have an unregulated television in the bedroom without the parent there to monitor is accepting the risk of fleeting expletives since for since all the years between Pacifica and Golden Globes that risk was present and is still present today depending on context. Um, what, let, what if that child watches the news tonight without a parent there to grab the television? Well, I, I think, Your Honor, that that is essentially an argument uh, against any regulation uh, of broadcast decency uh, on the theory that um, parents can simply not allow their children to no, watch it's television. It's not an but argument that was... against any regulation. It's just that I find it disingenuous to point to the fact that parents let children have televisions in their bedrooms that are unmonitored as a reason for the FCC to go galloping to the rescue. Um, I think parents know what they're doing when they let a child have a television in the bedroom and they're not there um, to monitor what is on that television. 
ditto with computers. I mean, that, that, that may be uh, the, the case, but the, the point of that, that factual finding to, to the FCC's analysis was simply that the, the rationales that Pacifica identified, that broadcasting is uniquely pervasive and uniquely accessible to children, uh, remain true And I'm today. asking you, don't parents know about the unique pervasiveness? That's really what I'm asking. You want to substitute. You want to protect those children even when their parents are lax. Well, that, that is the judgment that Congress made uh, in Section 1464, uh, and that is uh, the judgment that the court uh, has upheld uh, in, in Pacifica. Does the, the FCC, I think the answer to this is no, the FCC provide any kind of a means uh, as a guard against a, a chilling effect that goes that goes beyond appropriate borders um, for for pre-screening. Can a broadcaster come to the FCC and say we're planning to show this? Um, can we can we get a, a no action letter? Can we no, get some the, kind of a guarantee? The, the commission does not uh, pre-review uh, broadcasts or, or issue no action okay. letters. Uh, no, I mean, I, the, the commission has, has never done that. Uh, arguably, uh, Section 326 of the Communications Act would, would prevent it from doing that. Uh, I think what, that what, would be censorship? It, it, would, it would arguably be uh, a system of prior uh, restraint if the commission were to, to, to do that. But I, I think it's significant that even after... What's the difference between that and saying, well, if you guess wrong, we've got gotcha. you? Well, the, Why the, isn't that a prior restraint? The, the commission is, has not at all uh, adopted that policy, and I think this very case illustrates that. Uh, in the commission's treatment of share at the 2002 Billboard Awards, uh, the only the, the stated justification for not imposing a forfeiture in that case was that it was not clear at the time uh, of that broadcast that it would have uh, been actionable. So that's an additional well, safeguard. Yeah, it was now, the same. Now you've, made, excuse me, now you've made it clear that it is actionable. Well, that, that's right. My point is just that it, the, the uncertainty is mitigated um, by the fact that when, when it's not clear uh, that something would have been actionable, uh, the commission will stay its hand and not impose uh, a forfeiture. Um, so, so that's uh, some measure of assurance uh, that's given to broadcasters. And broadcasters also have the benefit uh, of the commission's orders, not just in this case, but in other cases. I mean, the, the commission, uh, rather than drawing lines uh, through rulemaking, uh, has chosen, as it's permitted under the APA and the Constitution, to proceed through adjudication and to uh, you know, sort of fill in uh, the pieces in a mosaic with individual adjudications uh, that create a picture uh, for broadcasters uh, of, of what's allowed. And the, an, an example of that is in the, the omnibus order. In this case, Part 3C of that order looked at a couple dozen broadcasts and found them not to be indecent. Um, the, 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 uh, order resolving complaints by the Parents Television Council in 2005, which we said in our brief, uh, also looked at a, another couple of dozen uh, broadcasts and found them not to be indecent. So there's a body of precedent uh, that gives guidance uh, to, to broadcasters. So I want to switch topics, if I may. Um, and you, the FCC, appears to have very little respect for the TV rating system. That is, they don't think it's sufficient, and that's why you need to uh, police the airwaves uh, to make sure fleeting expletives uh, don't harm children. Why have you never rescinded your finding that the rating system is acceptable under the statute? You never have. The, the, the statute called uh, for the commission within a year of the adoption, within a year of the enactment of the statute, uh, to make a determination of whether the plan uh, put forward by the networks was an acceptable one, and the Commission did that. Uh, but there's nothing inconsistent uh, about b between the statement that the plan was an acceptable one in 1998 and the conclusion uh, based on eight years of experience that the plan in practice uh, has not worked very well. But what if we were to draw the inference that the first time you finally levied criticism about the rating system is when you are called upon to defend this um, indecency regime that um, th that, that was the um, animating force I mean, of the it, criticism. In, in this case, the, the criticism was backed by specific factual findings uh, about the, the frequent misrating of broadcasts but as evidence. in effect, as you say, for eight years, and we never heard that, and you never asked the industry to improve the rating system, not once, until you were called upon to defend this new regime. Well, the, the, that, that, that's right, but the, 
that doesn't really go to the question of whether uh, the Commission's findings that the regime is ineffective are supported by substantial evidence. And the broadcasters here um, don't really make a serious effort. I mean, they cite to the 1998 uh, determination, but they don't make a serious effort to challenge the evidence. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been helpful if they were on notice that you found it um, um, so uh, useless because they would have had all these years to improve the system and improve because the system is crucial to the V-chip, and that would have been perhaps a way to do more narrow tailoring of the uh, broadcast uh, mediums than, than to bar every fleeting expletive that um, is offensive to community standards. P perhaps it would, and perhaps uh, in the future it would be possible uh, to do with additional regulatory or perhaps technological developments to develop a more effective rating system, but that does not make it a less restrictive alternative because a less restrictive alternative has to be something that could actually be put into place that actually exists today. And whatever else can be said about the V-chip or a hypothetical improved V-chip, uh, there isn't uh, that alternative that actually exists today. Is there no further questions? I have no further questions. Thank, Thank you, you, Council, very much. Mr. Phillips, you've reserved five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Let me begin by, with all due respect to Mr. Miller, his argument in this court is extraordinarily reminiscent of the approach that the FCC took in Pacifica itself. When, the, when called to account for the broad positions that the Commission has adopted, the Commission, when it gets to court, immediately retreats to some narrower position, one he couldn't even sustain today. In their brief, they go to great lengths to say that there are two orders at issue here and that the underlying Golden Globes is not at issue and in, under any circumstances. And yet, when pushed on it, obviously Golden Globes is at least at issue in this context because it is the only basis upon which the Commission can go down the path of going after fleeting expletives because the policy that precedes Golden Globes would consistently have permitted precisely what the network did in this particular case without any liability, whether with a forfeiture or without a forfeiture. And it seems to me that the court has to take a very careful look at the risks that come from affirming the commission under these circumstances and what will be poured into the, that vessel. If you read NBC's reply brief, it does an excellent job of saying that simply by giving some kind of leeway to the commission in this context, you end up down the road with a set of rules that are even more terroristic than the ones that we had in place at the outset of this litigation. So that's the first point I want to make. The second point, Judge Laval, is I want to go back to your question, which goes to sort of the core issue of, you know, when do you know that community standards tell you that something is patently offensive? And, the can and, and in candor, having listened to the argument on the other side, I have no clue at this point what it is that is offensive. We, we know that the Commission focuses on first blow. Now, that can't be the problem if the Commission says to, tonight you can broadcast uh, this argument live, and you can broadcast Cher and Nicole Ritchie uh, presenting exactly the same words that were out there. That first blow argument is completely set aside. So how, do, how are we to know now under what circumstances the community, whatever that means, will find particular use patently offensive? And the answer is the only way you know that is after the Commission's five unelected individuals take a vote and decide up or down with respect to how, which of these statements well, are permissible. Say that they have a, a, a lot of interaction with um, uh, the, uh, the entire world. Have, uh, have they ever interacted in advance with, uh, with your I, I'm still waiting for the call, but no, <laughs> no, I mean, the reality is I'm sure that the Commission has been interacting with the world for the last 30 years. I, I can't imagine that they were sitting in their offices up until 2004 not listening to anybody and then suddenly turned on the phone and started, uh, or maybe turned on the computer. I do think they probably get a lot of more emails than they used to, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily a source of great interaction. And at a minimum, it certainly doesn't remotely justify, and either as a reasoned explanation or as a factual matter, a fundamental 180 degree change. And the other part that makes that impermissible is it's, it's, this is not just an APA challenge. It is that, to be sure. But we are talking about a 180 degree change with respect to protected First Amendment activities. And so when you're going to change your enforcement approach and you're dealing with First Amendment rights, you have an even greater, the Commission has a greater burden in this context than in other contexts. And that burden is not satisfied 
by some allegation that, our, that, this, that this speech is gratuitous. That's not the issue. This is First Amendment protected. The burden is on them to demonstrate that there's some reason why that speech isn't allowed to be broadcast. And that's a burden they're unwilling to sustain. Their claim that we have never defended this speech <coughs> is nonsense. The claim that, that we have never defended this speech is nonsense. It is First Amendment protected statement. That's what the court said in Pacifica. That's what the commission has recognized for more than 30 years. Indeed, even in this order, they that's recognize. Because it's indecent and not obscene. There's no, there's no allegation anywhere that what we're talking about is obscene speech. Exactly. And that's the, that's the fundamental difference. The, in the DC circuit, this speech is protected by the fullest extent of the least restrictive means compelling state interest standards. And nothing in what the Commission has suggested to you remotely satisfies that standard. Now, to be sure, you can decide it on a narrower ground that this is simply arbitrary, that the creation of the Commission as a sensorial board, using the kind of loose standards they're using here, violates any notions of, of reasoned decision making, that that's arbitrary as an APA matter. But at some point, those two positions become dovetail. And it not only violates the APA, but frankly, it violates the First Amendment as well. Uh, unless there are additional questions, Your Honors, I would urge you to set I aside no the Commission. I have no additional order. questions. I want to thank you both for a lively and very helpful argument and all of the participants for a wonderful briefing. Thank you, Your uh, Honor. Thank you. We'll take a 10 minute adjournment now. <clears throat>